take to God in prayer from our church family. And uh, I, I want to invite you to join me in prayer for these things. And let's, let's give them to God and see what he will do with them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for being our good God, our holy God, one who cares, one who loves. And uh, Father, we know that you are interested in even the smallest details of our lives. And so, Lord, it's our joy to bring to you these requests from our church family. And, um, and Lord, our church family itself, Lord, we know that uh, we need your grace and we need your love, especially in this time when um, our lives are so hindered and so... Um, so changed because of COVID-19, but God, your spirit is able and you can do mighty things through us. So I pray that you would cause us to, to seek you more and more. Lord, I want to bring to you Gary Stevenson as he goes through cancer treatments, treatments right now. Father, thank you for his faithfulness in attending and his, his love for you. And I pray that you would hold him close and that uh, you would comfort him and um, help him to hear from you in this time. And may he be encouraged by your spirit. I pray for Dave Houston as he recovers from his, his uh, foot injury as well. Lord, it's going to be a long road to recovery for him. And I know he's got surgery on the 29th as well. So I pray that you would prepare the doctors for that surgery. And um, may it go smoothly. I pray that this time of, of forced rest would be a time of renewal in his spirit and his mind. And, and I pray that he would hear from you and be encouraged by your spirit. Lord, I want to pray for the Hillside Church plant. Lord, especially now they're wanting to reach out with the gospel and, and, and seeing that they, they need more workers for what they are doing. And so I pray that you would provide people to join them in the work of your Holy Spirit, sharing the gospel, and that uh, through their labor, through their efforts, people would come to know you, be strengthened in their faith in you, and that you would grow that church, I pray. Lord, I pray for Sarah Bouchard and, and the rest of the Bouchard family as... Um, she's on bed rest. Lord, I pray for your continued grace and strength. Lord, it's a challenging time, and uh, you care for her. You care for her little one. I pray that you would um, hold this little one close, bring it to a healthy delivery, and I pray that the Bouchard family would be strengthened and encouraged in their relationships together through this. And Lord, you see our situation here in Timmins and how we are a light here in downtown, and it's it's a dark place, but Lord, your light is stronger than the dark. It casts out darkness. And so, Lord, the ministries of this church, may they always point towards your light, show your light, mirror your light to this town. I pray that in our interactions with our neighbors, with, with those who come through our doors, uh, whether it's just for food bank um, or anything else, Lord, that they would sense this light, that they would see you at work and receive your love and draw many people to yourself through the ministry that we have here in downtown Timmins. Encourage our hearts as well, Lord, uh, from within this church family as we serve. Help us to remember that, uh, Lord, this church is made up of individuals who have been changed in their lives because of Jesus. And so it is Jesus in us who does the work through us. And I pray that you would turn our eyes to you so that, Lord, we can continue to be faithful and to, to trust you with the work of our hands so that people come to know you here in this town. I pray your blessing over the rest of the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Well, we have an opportunity to welcome a couple of people into membership at this time. And in case you're wondering what uh, being a church member is all about, it uh, basically is a public showing of the fact that you are on this team together and you're willing to show up, you're willing to use the gifts that God has given you to serve, you're willing to uh, give to support the church financially, and uh, Dave and Ruby Ollerton have uh, moved up into Timmins, they're living uh, somewhere that way, um, outside of town, uh, but uh, Dave and Ruby love the Lord, and uh, they have trusted Him, they have been baptized as believers, those are our two conditions to be members, is that you have a professed faith in Christ and that you are baptized by immersion. And uh, we want to publicly welcome them into membership. And so at this time, we're going to do a COVID membership welcome, all right? The first time that we have done this during COVID. So if you are one of the people that's on the oversight team or deacons or uh, pastors, you don't have to just stand in place where you are. Uh, so Doug, stand up. Maybe Doug's the only one that's here. Anybody else? Is, oh, and there's Carmen. I forgot. Carmen and Sam. That's great. Um, and so... Uh, we're going to give them the long distance elbow uh, welcome, or you guys you can high five them from the distance as well. Dave and Ruby are over here, so Dave and Ruby, would you stand up as well, just over here? 
Um, and uh, Dave Ruby, it's a pleasure to welcome you guys in the membership. I have the, had the privilege to hear their testimonies, their stories of how they came to know the Lord. It's a great story. You want to hear it, and so bug them later on, or not bug them, right? Ask them uh, later on to share their testimony of God's faithfulness and goodness, and we're so grateful that you're part of our northern community now, and um, the way this works is we're just going to give them a round of applause, and they're going to be in the membership just like that. So, all right. Thank you, guys. We're looking forward to many years of serving together. Thank you, guys. And if you want to become a member as well, come talk to myself or Pastor John or any one of the uh, uh, people that you saw standing up as well, and we'd love to talk to you about what that means to be a, a member here as well. All right, we're going to sing uh, one more song before the message. We open the God's Word. This is called Only Holy God.
right, please grab a seat and grab your Bibles. Elijah, come on up and read. Good morning, church. My name is Elijah, and I'll be reading the Bible from the book of Genesis, chapter 42, from verse 1 to 38. That's the whole of the chapter. It's a long chapter, so please just sit down, relax, and enjoy the reading. Yeah. <laughs> Genesis 42, verse 1. When Jacob saw that there was when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy it for us there, that we may live and not die. So Joseph, ten brothers, went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers for he said lest some calamity befall him and the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed for the famine was in the land of Canaan now Joseph was governor over the land and it was he who sold to all the people of the land and Joseph's brother came and bowed before him with their faces to the earth Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, You are spies. You, may come, you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, No, my lord. But your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's son. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. But Jesus said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying you are spies. In the manner you shall be tested. But by the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison three days. Then Jesus said to them the third day, do this and leave, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house. But you, go and carry grain for the famine of your houses. And bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us. And we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them. For he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and talked with them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain, to restore every man's money to his sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. So they loaded their donkeys with grains and departed from them. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money, and there it was in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, My money has been restored, and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts filled them, and they were afraid, saying to one another, What is this that God has done to us? Then they went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of one father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the lord of the country, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. 
Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any calamity shall befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Praise the Lord. Uh, amen. Thank you, Elijah, for reading God's Word. Don't you love that man's voice? Man, I wish I had that voice. That's great. Thanks, Elijah. appreciate that. Well, um, we're going to be diving into God's Word this morning. I really want to encourage you and challenge you to make sure you have uh, the Bible with you in your hands or turned on on your device. We do have extra copies back at the back table right where Ray is there if you do need one. Uh, but here's why. All right? These, uh, this is not about me just waxing eloquent or sharing a speech, but we're learning about who God is, and we're learning about who God is from his word, and how we need to respond to him. And so uh, make sure you, I, what I'm saying is backed up by the word. The way you do that is by having it open in front of you, all right? So uh, we're going to pray, and we're going to dive right in. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for another opportunity to gather together as uh, people who are seeking you, as people who call you by name. Thank you that you are our Father and thank you for Jesus Christ who came to this earth to pay the penalty for our sins. And when we put our faith in you, Lord Jesus, we have life everlasting. And this is the reason why we gather, because we are your children. And so thank you for your word. Thank you for what it teaches us about who you are and about how we can live in this world. And this morning we're going to be learning, hey, God, we do not need to fear anything else when we fear you. And so, Lord, I pray for each one here today, whether they're online or whether they're in person, Lord, that you'd help us to make sure our fears are in the right place and help us as we learn about what it means to fear you, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, when I was growing up in the 80s, uh, there is this clothing brand called No Fear. Does anybody remember that? Raise your hand if you're uh, my age. All right. All right. Good stuff. Well, maybe you remember this. It's still in line today. It's a No Fear clothing brand, and uh, I proudly wore the No Fear t-shirt uh, because, well, everybody who was anybody wore the No Fear t-shirt. But I also wore it because, you know what? I wanted to present an image. I'm a man. I fear nothing. Ugh. All right? This is the image that I wanted to project to my peers and friends around me. And, uh, you know, the reality is, is that the, you and I, we face a lot of fears, don't we? I mean, there's lots to be afraid of in this world. The reality is this, though, that we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid if our fear is in the Lord himself. And this is where we're going today as we take a look and unpack chapter 42 of Genesis. And so when I was younger also, I had this fear of the dark. Anybody there with me? You know, you had this fear of the dark. Maybe you uh, struggle with that still. I don't know, but a fear of the dark. And here's why I had this fear of the dark. Because when I was going to sleep and my closet door happened to be left open, I would take a look at the clothes, and somehow, magically, they would form into the shape of this giant monster-type man who would somehow move, at least in my mind anyways, who would move and, you know, come out to get me until, of course, I put my covers over my head. Also, it was really weird, and I can't explain this to this day, but I, have, I had soldier wallpaper, and there was like these was like Civil War soldiers on the wall. And there was times when I would look in the dark, and those soldiers would be marching and moving. And I'm like, well, that's freaky, all right? And then I would close my eyes. Now, that's some of the reason why I was scared of the dark then. And uh, I'm a little bit sometimes still scared of the dark now, because you know when you go in the bush, and it's like pitch dark, and you hear that crack in the bush, like, what is that, all right? You know, there's still that a little bit uh, today as well. But we're going to be taking a look at what is it that we should be fearing, and what is that we shouldn't be fearing? Because we have a lot of misplaced fears, don't we? I mean, we fear what people will think of us. We fear failure. We fear that 
if we stand up for a biblical sexual ethic, we'll be called haters and bigots. We fear people rejecting us. We fear that when God calls us to step out and do something that, man, is God really going to have us when he calls, out, calls us out to uh, step out of our comfort zone? We're afraid to give generously and sacrificially because we wonder, hey, are we going to have enough money to pay the bills? We're afraid to obey God sometimes and follow his word because we're not quite sure it's going to work out the way that God says it's going to work out. We're afraid we might catch something, get sick, and die. The fear is everywhere, right? Fear is everywhere. But it's often misplaced. We fear the things we shouldn't, and we don't fear the one we should. We don't fear the one we should. God does not want us cowering in the corner, church. He doesn't want us afraid of everything, because when we're afraid of everything else, our fear is misplaced, it's not where it should be, and we're not doing and not living the way that God wants us to live. And so as we continue to plot series today in the story of Joseph, here's what we see. We see a man going through all these ups and downs of life. We know the roller coaster that he's been on, right? He goes from this peak of being the favorite son to being betrayed by his brother, sold into slavery, falsely accused of rape, thrown into prison, only to rise to the most, second most prominent position in the land, all over the place. And God is working through all these details for Joseph's good and for God's glory, isn't he? And so here's our theme verse for this series coming up. There it is. Oops, I went a little too far. Genesis 50, verse 22. All right, say it with me. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. I want to encourage you to memorize that. Click that into your brain so that you can pull it up when you need to. And so here we are in Genesis chapter 42. And I don't know if you caught this or not, but when I take a look at this chapter, I think we see this contrast between Joseph, who was a man who feared God, and his brothers and his father, who were struggling to fear everything else. They struggle with fear of everything else. And I want to encourage us this morning to make sure that we have our fears in the right spot, because here's the reality. Here's our big idea for the day. If you're following along the app or filling in the blanks, here's the first one. It says, fearing God overcomes every other fear. Fearing God overcomes every other fear. Let's say that together. Here we go. Fearing God overcomes every other fear. Now, here's the question that a lot of people have, and it is this. What does it mean to fear God? Ever wonder that? What does it mean to fear God? Now, some would say that it is a respect for God, and that's capturing a little bit of it, but it is so much more than just a respect for God because we have respect for each other. We have respect for our teachers and those in authority over us, but it's so much more than just a respect. It doesn't go far enough. God isn't just you know, our buddy-buddy that we show respect to, right? He's so much more than that. He's Almighty God who spoke this word into existence. And so fearing God really is this. It is the ultimate act of worship. It is having this awe of God's holiness, of his majesty, of his almightiness, if you will, that results in me then hating sin like God hates sin. Now, if you Google fearing God, this is what you will come up with. A picture of a shoe. Did you know this? Nike has created a shoe called the fear of God. I'm not quite sure that they have the fear of God in them, if they would be putting out a shoe called the fear of God. Anyways, here's what this is, is what you Google. Not at all what the scripture teaches us when it comes to fearing God. This is an awe of who God is, of his holiness, so that we then hate sin like God hates sin. A couple of verses to back that up in Psalm 33 verse 8, it says this. Let all the earth do what? Fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world do what? Stand in awe of him. See, when we go to books like Proverbs and Psalms, they're written in Hebrew poetry, and this is called synonymous parallelism, which means one line is equal to the next. And so we can see how do we define the fear of the Lord? Let all the earth fear the Lord. It's defined by those who stand in awe of him. So if you want to fear God, you're standing in awe of him, of who he is and of what he has done. The next verse that kind of helps build this is this, is Proverbs 8, 13. It says this, to fear the Lord is to do what, church? Hate evil. Hate evil. Pushing it away. The sin that we so, get so easily trips us up, the sin that we want to do, we're hating it. We're trying to kill it in our lives. We don't want to embrace it. We want to push it aside. We want to hate it. That is the definition of what it means to fear God. 
Oh, a little bit too far there. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, we get a really good idea of what it means to fear God. Because Isaiah is standing before the Lord, and he, if you know this, he's saying, Woe is me. I am undone. I stand before a holy God as an unclean person. This gives us a really good picture of what it means to fear God. So let's just read this, picking up in verse 3. It says, And one called to another, that's the, uh, the, the seraphim, the angels, calling to one another and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Catch it. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, that's Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. That gives us a really good picture of what it means to have this awe of God, a fearing God. Woe is me as we're in his presence. I don't deserve to be in his presence, yet because of Christ, we can stand in his presence. And so as we go to the life of Joseph, Joseph has a lot to be afraid of, doesn't he? I mean, thrown in prison, right? Living life, and God, where in the world are you all of this? Lots to be afraid of. But you see his response is one of deepening trust. His relationship grows, and God is forming and shaping him into the man of God that he is becoming. And guess what God is doing with us today? In the situations that we find ourselves in, he is forming and shaping us into the men and women of God that he wants us to be. And so my question as we grapple with this text today is, who or what are you fearing? Are you fearing God? Or are you fearing everything else? Because when you're fearing everything else, I can tell you life will not go well. But when you fear God, life is going to go the way it should, the way it's intended. It's the way it's intended. So let's take a look at Genesis 42 again. And I think the, the focus of this chapter of Genesis 42 is right in verse 18. When Joseph's responding to his brothers, this is, I think, the climax, the focal point of the chapter. Verse 18 says this, do this and you will live. Joseph says this, for I, what? For I fear God. The reason why, it's kind of my modus operandi, right? The reason why I'm responding this way, the reason why I do what I do is because I fear God. That's a, a goal that we should be shooting for as well, right? Fearing God, the reason why we do everything, our modus operandi, the way we live life is because we fear God. Why did Joseph fear God? Well, we've already kind of established it, but he saw, I think, as he looks back on the past 13 years of his life, he saw God at work. He saw God moving, forming, and shaping him. And in this chapter, we actually see a fulfillment of one of the dreams that God gave Joseph earlier. Do you remember in, uh, we began this series in chapter 37? Joseph had a, a couple of dreams. Who was bowing before Joseph? Do you remember? His brothers in those dreams. So two separate dreams, one meaning his brothers are going to come before him and they're going to bow down before him. He said this at 17 years old. He is the second youngest son. All of his older brothers and his father and his mother would bow down before him. I mean, man, would that, would that ever happen? Well, guess what? In this chapter, we see it happening. We're flash-forwarding 13 years. Joseph's brothers have no idea who they're bowing before, yet they're on their faces bowing before this man. The Joseph, who's no longer a 17-year-old boy, but he is a man. He's probably wearing Egyptian clothing, not Hebrew clothing. He's second in command now, no longer a slave. He's not dead, and they expected him to be. He's speaking Egyptian, not Hebrew. They had no idea who this guy was. In verse 6 of chapter 42, we see this. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. And then verse 8 says, Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. And then verse 9, Joseph remembered the dreams he had dreamed of them. Can you just imagine the position that Joseph is in? All this crazy life that's happening. And then he flashes back as he sees his brothers on their faces, remembering, God, you are so good. Your promise has come true. And I fear you because of that. He remembered the God he worshipped, the God who was in control of the entire world and everything, and he chose to fear him. See, church, the reality is this, that fearing God is not an option for us. 
As those who follow Jesus, fearing God is not an option. The follower of Jesus fears God. We are commanded to. Question is this. Do you know what the most repeated command in all the scriptures, I kind of gave it away, it is what? Do not fear, or do not be afraid, or fear not. Right? So we see the phrase, do not be afraid, 38 times. Fear not is actually in there hundreds of times. I didn't have time to count them all. Hundreds of times. Why does God say that? Because he knows our frame. We're afraid of everything. And God comes along and says, don't be afraid. Fear not. Instead, fear me. If you fear me, you don't have to be afraid of everything else. So we're commanded over and over again in Scripture to not be afraid. Take your Bibles and flip over to the New Testament. First book in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is talking to his followers in Matthew chapter 10, 26 to 31. And he says this, talking about the people who are going to hate his followers because of who they are. He says, don't be afraid of them. Have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And catch it, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him, that's God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So fear not, therefore. Are you not of more value than many sparrows? So everyone who acknowledges me before men... I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Did you catch it there? We don't need to fear people who can kill our bodies. Why? Because we fear the one who is far greater than that. We fear the one who provides the food for the sparrows. We don't need to worry about what we're going to eat because God feeds the sparrows. He's going to feed us. Again, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 41. Back to Isaiah. We're going to be all over the place here today. Isaiah 41 Verses 10 and 13 say this. Fear not, for why? I am with you. Be not dismayed, why? For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then over to verse 13. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. What do we get from that? God's holding our hands through all the craziness of life. We don't need to fear it. He's got it. He's got us. And then this command in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 13 says this. Solomon, who most scholars think wrote this book, sums everything up, the entire thing. Our life, everything in general. This is the end of the matter. All has been heard he summarizes it in this one sentence. Life can be summarized, boiled down to this. Fear God, keep his commandments, period. If you do that, life is going to go good for you, right? This is the whole duty of man. This is the whole duty of man. So if we want to live life well, if you want to live life successfully, do those things. Fear God, keep his commandments. And the way that we fear God is first and foremost by putting our faith and trust in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. So let me ask you this question. You've probably asked this yourself before. What is the result of fearing God? If I fear God, what, well, what will go well for me if I do that? Well, the Bible is pretty clear about this in a number of different places. I just want to highlight a couple. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, we say that it says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what, church? How many of you want to be wise? Guess where it starts? Fearing God, right? Fearing God. How about this one? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? How many want to be smart? Raise your hands if you want to be smart. There's some people not raising your hands. I'm questioning whether you're listening or where you're at. I'm not sure. All right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We want to be wise. We want to know stuff. If you want to do that, it starts with fearing God. Putting your fears in the right place. Fearing God. Then, over in Proverbs 14, verse 27, it says this. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of what? Life. To depart from the snares of death. If you want to live life well now, and if you want to have eternal life, fear God. Fear God. See, fear itself, outside of God, enslaves us, and it paralyzes us, doesn't it? When we're afraid of everything, well, we're useless for not much. Right? We're not useful, I'm sorry, said, we're not useful for much. When we're stuck up with fear, worry, and stress, we're not very good for the kingdom of God. 
because we're too focused on our fears. Instead, we should be focusing on the Lord, the one who is actually worthy of your fear. And so in this text, we're going to spend time just addressing three fears that a lot, many people struggle with, that we see Joseph's brothers struggle with because they had misplaced fears. So here's the first thing that we see, a fear of the future. Well, I know a lot of people struggle with that. Guess where anxiety is often rooted in, in worry? It's rooted in this fear of the future. Worry, anxiety are, are, are anticipating a negative outcome that's going to happen. And we're all freaked out about it. Right? We're all freaked out about it. And we see this happening in verses 1 to 4 of Genesis 42. This fear of the future. And it's located for Jacob in a fear of what's going to happen to his last remaining favorite love son whose name was Benjamin. Right? And so his fear of the future was lopped into his children. Now, those of you who are parents know this fear because we are afraid oftentimes of what's going to happen to our kids. Are they going to grow up well? All right. When they're out, are they going to come back safe? Right. Can I release them into God's hands? It's so easy as a parent to fear the future for our kids. And so this fear of the future is also represented in the, the fear of the unknown, right? We what if things to death, right? Have you ever, ever what if stuff? Well, we, what if this is going to happen? What if that's going to happen? What about this, right? That's fear, that's anxiety about the future. We need to just trust God in the here and now, right? What if I lose my job? What if I don't have money for this, right? What will happen to my kids? What if, what if, what if? We what if ourselves to death sometimes. And we see this what if happening to Jacob as well. So the family's facing famine. Jacob sends 10 of his 11 sons to Egypt for an extended takeout order, if you will. And then verses 3 and 4 of Genesis chapter 42, we see this happening. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he what? Feared that harm might happen to him. I mean, isn't that encapsulate the fear of the future? That might happen, so I'm not going to do it. Ever been there before? I'm like, we're all, we've all been there before, right? And in this case, he's afraid. He can't let his child go because he's afraid of what might happen. Now, there's some press into this. Right? Remember the story of Joseph? Remember last time he saw Joseph with the uh, other 10 brothers, right? So some precedent. There's a little bit of stuff happening going on, right? The other 10 can't really be trusted. They call themselves, and you've caught this a couple times, they call themselves honest men. I mean, how far from the truth is that for these guys? These guys aren't honest in any way, shape, or form. They're still keeping this secret from their dad about what happened to Joseph. But the reason Jacob is afraid for his boy is what's concerning because the reason is he has replaced Joseph as the favorite son with Benjamin. And he has placed Benjamin above God. See, his child has become an idol. It's so easy for us to do the very same thing as our parents. Or the very same thing with our kids, I should say. As parents. We take our kids and we elevate them above the status of God. And when you do that, you make your child an idol. That is a very bad place for your child to be. Not good for you as a parent to put them there. And so we got to make sure we as parents do not make our children into idols. Our job is to raise them for 18 years and then do this. Release them into God's care. We do our best with the time that we have with them. We teach them about the Lord to fear God. We teach them about God's word. And then we go, God, they are yours. Release. And can I encourage you? I know that many parents struggle with this. Release your kids into God's care and trust him that he has them. It's not your job to worry about them. Your job is to release and trust God. Don't do what Jacob did here. See, the reason why we don't need to fear the future is this. It's because we fear the God who knows the future. Are you willing to trust God with your future because he already knows it? Are you willing to do that? See, it's really pointless to worry about your future anyways. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this, Who of you, by being anxious or worrying, can add a single hour to your lifespan? Anybody? 
Uh, no. Actually, uh, the doctors in the house will probably back this up. I'm pretty sure. Ask Dr. Doug later. If you worry, you actually shorten your lifespan. Right? When you're all stressed out, worried, anxiety, guess what happens to this thing called your heart? It blows up. All right? Not good for you to worry about the future. Jesus assures us he has our future, so we don't need to worry about it. He says in Matthew, in this chapter, I look after the birds and the flowers. They're so much more important than me, or than, to, to me than you. Whatever, you know what I'm saying. All right? I will look after you too. And then verse 34, Jesus says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Worry about the here and now. So if you're fearful for your child, your family, it's time to let go of the idol, trust God with their future, give them over to the Lord, because our kids aren't really ours anyways. So the reason why you have kids is because God has gifted them to you. You are a steward. Just like everything else, you're a steward of your children. Steward them well, release them to God. Train them up in the fear of the of the Lord, and then release them. Well, second thing that oftentimes we struggle with when it comes to fearing is this, is a fear of the past. It's a fear, fear of the past. And the fear of the past can haunt us until the day we die. I mean, there's so many people I run into as a pastor who are afraid of what they have done that somehow God can't forgive them because they are stuck in this past thing, whatever they have done. Oh, if I walk into the doors of that church, right, I'm going to burst into flames. Maybe some of you have thought or said that before. I guess what? I have never seen anyone uh, combust instantaneously when they walk through these doors. All right? And there's been a lot of bad people walk through this door, starting with me. All right? So uh, nobody's going to burst into flames, but your past can't haunt you. We see this happening with Joseph's brothers. They were stuck in the past, and when you can't, you're stuck in the past, you can't live in the present. Right? Joseph's brothers had this fear of the past that haunted them. And why? Because they never asked for or received forgiveness. And so verse 17, we pick it up there of Genesis chapter 42. Verse 17 says this, Joseph put his brothers, all of them, into custody for three days. Can you imagine Joseph's like, I cannot wait. I, yes, my brothers are here. They're bound before them. Lord, what should I do? I know what, I'll put them in jail for three days and see what happens after that, right? Uh, I just love that, right? And we're going to get to that in a couple of weeks as we talk about forgiveness. But I digress, all right? In verse 21, the brothers are released, they're sent back, and they say this, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul. He begged us to let him go, and we did not listen. This is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? Don't you love that? Typical older brother. If you would have done what I said, none of this would have happened. All right? But you didn't listen. So now there's a reckoning for his blood. Their past has come back to bite them for what they had done for Joseph. They said, we deserve this treatment because we had, well, the way we treated our brother. And let's pick it up in verse 28. It says, they found their money back in their sacks. What would this do? What's the big deal about this money in their sacks? Well, it would confirm exactly what Joseph was accusing them of. Joseph accused them to be what? You catch it in the text? Spies. Wouldn't that just confirm exactly what they're stealing the money that they just gave to Joseph back? Like they're, they're done. Like this is, you lose your head over less things with Pharaoh, right? Remember the baker, right? Like his bread didn't quite rise all the way that one day. Okay, I don't know what it was, but maybe that's what it was. And he's like on the job and block, okay? So at this, verse 28, their hearts failed them. And they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? Ever been in that spot before? God, why? Why? What are you doing? I don't understand. But the fear of the past turned these men really into waifs literally shaking in their boots. Their fear paralyzed them. And I want you to notice what happened next. What did their fear of the past lead them to? Instead of fearing God, they blamed God, right? They blamed God. Why God? Why God? Why God? The reality is this, the consequences can kick, right? They can kick hard. But we don't need to be afraid of our past when we fear the God who forgives. When we fear the God who forgives, we don't need to be stuck in the past, Yes, consequences from your stupid choices are still probably going to come to bear someday. But we don't need to worry about that or fear about that because we trust the God 
who forgives our past. So often in uh, sessions I have with people, I bring up Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It is a beautiful scripture that you need to memorize. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, once we put our faith and trust in Christ, our past no longer needs to haunt us because it has been forgiven. We are released from those sins and we need to trust that God has dealt with them. Don't believe the lie that Satan wants to come and keep bringing those past sins up. Look what you did. Remember what you did back there? Oh, you can never get free from that. Yes, you can. Don't get sucked into that. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But why? Because our sin no longer defines us. You are now a child of the king. You're a new creation. So the solution to the fear of the past is this. Confess your sin and receive forgiveness for it. Receive it. The Bible says your sin is gone, buried in the deep of the ocean, as far as the east is from the west, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Don't get stuck, paralyzed in the past. Well, final thing that we often struggle with when it comes to fear is a fear of death. Verse 35, we see that. This is really the biggest fear we face as humans. You interview people on the street, this, I guarantee you, would be one of their fears. People are afraid of dying. Why? Because they don't know what's next and they don't have their future secure. As followers of Jesus, what do we have? We have a hope that secures our future, which means we can look death in the face and no longer fear it. Now, do we love dying? Not fun, all right? Dying's painful, it's not a great thing to go through. My least favorite thing to do is, is, is officiate at funerals. I don't enjoy that part of my job, but I get to do it anyways. Dying is not fun, but we don't need to fear death because our future is secured in and through Jesus. And so we pick it up in verse 35. This is what the brothers are fearing. They faced death. Verse 35 says, as they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. So not just one guy was in trouble. They were all in trouble. And when they saw and their father saw the bundles of money, they were what? Trembling in their boots because they knew their heads were going to be lost. They knew they're done. So they fear death. But for the one who fears God, like I said, we don't have to fear death. We have hope. So over in your Bibles, turn in to 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. It's right after the book of Romans. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It reminds us of the hope that we have and the reason why we no longer have to fear death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 54 to 57 says this. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when we put our faith in Jesus, we put our faith in the one who is the resurrection and the life. The one who actually looked death in the face, kicked it in the teeth, said, you have no power over me, and rose from the grave. That is our hope. Paul says earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus doesn't rise, we're in big trouble because we worship a dead guy in the ground, and we have no hope of life after death. But because he did rise, we do have this hope. And so we too can look at death and say, you have no victory over me. Grave, you have no control over me because I have put my faith and trust in the one who's the resurrection and the life. We have a new hope that death is not the end, but it's a beautiful beginning. And that's what we see over in Romans chapter 21, verse four, where it says this, he will wipe every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. Now there shall be mourning, crying, or pain. Isn't that great? This is our future. This is our hope. And so right now we're in this in-between, right? We're stuck in this now but not yet, where we see our friends and our family dying. But if they die in Christ, we're going to be reunited with them as we put our faith and trust in Christ. And we have that hope of being with Jesus forevermore. So church, reality, life is scary, but we don't have to be afraid of it. We don't have to fear our past. We don't have to fear the future. 
And we don't have to fear death when we fear God. So I want to encourage you to put your fear where it belongs. And so ask yourself this question. Be honest with yourself. Who or what do you fear? If God isn't at the top of the list, then you're going to find yourself just like Joseph's brothers and his father, capitulating to fear, being stuck in the past, worried about the future, worried about death. You don't have to be that. You can live in freedom through Jesus if you would put your fear where it belongs. So I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you haven't yet trusted Jesus and you're still facing those three fears. It's time to give your life to the Lord by simply repenting of your sins, believing the fact that Jesus in real time, space, and history died, paid the penalty for your sins. He was a substitute for you. And then he really rose from the grave. The Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus will be what, church? Saved. You will be saved from death. The second death, which is separation from God in a place called hell. The Bible says that's appointed a man once to die and then face judgment. So if you don't have Christ, you will face judgment and you will have hell as your return. I don't want that for you. You don't want that for you. Trust me. Put your faith and trust in Jesus and you don't have to worry about death. It no longer has control over you. And so if that's you today, you want to turn your life over to the Lord, do it. Because you don't know whether you have tomorrow. Because you don't know the future, but God does. But for the rest of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus, so often we get stuck, don't we? We get stuck in those fears. And it's time to stop living in fear and start fearing God. And if you need someone to pray over you, like, I'm just stuck. I, I can't get over these fears that I'm facing. That's why I'm here. That's why John's here. That's why Doug's here and Sam. And, and that's why your community group is here. We want to love you through those fears and get, help you get released from those fears so you can live in the freedom that God wants you to live in. And if that's you today, hey, come and talk. We'd love to chat you, pray you through what these fears are. Let's not live in fear of the fears around us, but let's fear the one who deserves our fear. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you know the hearts of everybody here today. You know the fears that we struggle with. Lord, help us to release, get released from those fears and continue to be in awe and respect, love you, God. And in our fear, let's no longer embrace sin, but let's turn away from it and turn aside from it. And I know that you know, many people might be stuck in sin. Maybe that sin is unbelief, just being unwilling to trust you. God, I pray that you would help them to get over that unbelief, that doubt, and just fully embrace Christ and, and trust him for their future. Lord, I pray for those of us who are embracing the Lord, but still struggle with fears, whether it's fearing what's going to happen with our kids, whether it's the fear of the future, whether it's the fear of our past, and we can't get over that sin. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, through God's Spirit, be free from those things so that we can no longer fear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to say this together, Psalm 56, verse 3 and 4. Great verse. This is what we teach our kids from when they're really young, waking up in the middle of the night to recite this, memorize it. It is a great couple of verses. So let's say it together. Here we go. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise. In God, I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? We're going to sing a closing song uh, called I Will Fear No More. Daniel, go ahead and start playing us, playing us up there, buddy.
hope that's your prayer as you leave, that you will fear no more the stuff around you, but that your fears will be in God alone. I want to invite you back next Sunday as we continue in the plot twist series. We're going to be into Genesis chapter 43 and 44. And if you do have any questions about today, I know that we uh, covered a lot of ground. Feel free to stay around, hang around, and uh, ask those questions. I know we do have uh, at least one online question, so you're welcome to hang around and uh, hang out with, with people. If, when you do make your way out, head over, right that exit right there, make your way down the stairs around the corner and out through the side door. It looks like it's sort of sunny outside, so you can also hang around and chat outside as well. God bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, the Father, of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Il y a tant de choses à